My name is Peter Richard Demosky. I was born in the village of Nolato, 1942. I didn't know my mother. I understand she passed away in 1945 when I was three years old. Soon after that, my dad sent me to the Holy Cross Mission, a combination boarding school, orphanage. In those days, our parents were still nomadic and our dad couldn't take care of us in the village of Noado and still go out trapping, hunting. My earliest memories being raised in the mission, we did what we want, we played every day, we didn't have to work. Until I turned nine years old, then they shipped me from the little children's side to the boys' side, cutting wood, working in the garden, working at fish camps, etc. Uh, children who came in, you know, they were punished for speaking their language. Uh, they were, I think they, they were trying to westernize us, okay, and made us forget. In fact, I was actually ashamed of being a native, you know, but there was a lot of corporal punishment that they had no compunction at all about using. They, they whipped us with everything they had. <laughs> Razor straps, willows, sticks. We didn't know any other life, so that's just something we lived with every day. <laughs> they made us go to church every day. It did get pretty tiring. They beat it into you, they harped it on you every day. I used to be able to say the Our Father, the Hail Mary, whatever, all in Latin, because you know, they made us learn that. My grandma, Martha, whom I dearly loved, she'd send gifts down, a box of candy or a little box of small toys or something. Okay, I remember receiving those boxes from her. I never knew who she was. You know. I remember good times. Um, I came out of there with a good education. Holy Cross Mission closed its doors in 1956, and they selected a group of us to bring with them to a new school, Copper Valley. They picked us up in small bush planes, several kids at a time. When we got to Copper, we were mingled with white children. And that's the first for people like me. You know, we never went to school with white children before. So it didn't take long for us to associate with each other, became good friends. I will admit I was a good student. I excelled in every subject I had. I was on the boxing team in high school. I, I don't think I got beat in high school. <laughs> it's a way to release your aggression or whatever, yeah, whatever. Yeah. No, I, I like basketball too, you know, but a lot of us weren't that tall at Copper Valley. So we go to a place like West Valley in Anchorage where all those kids are 6'4", six, 6'5", six, whatever. Those are memorable games, yeah. <laughs> I completed high school there. When you're raised in a mission and you've never been to your village for years, so you're meeting your aunts, your uncles, you're meeting my grandma for the first time. Um, I, 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 I can't express it in words. My dad, for about six months, I lived with him and got to know him. Before he passed away, he took me aside and told me, get a good education, Peter. You'll need it. I went to Palmer and got a job working on some farm. Milk cows, drove tractors, cleared land, just to make some money to go to college in New Mexico. And that fall, I went to New Mexico for my freshman year of college. I wasn't used to the desert. 
I rarely got out of the dormitory campus. No, no place to go though. I didn't like the country. <laughs> so I transferred back to university in Fairbanks. <laughs> and the Vietnam War was going on and, we, and it was on the news every day. And uh, I knew I was getting up to being drafted. So I said, well, I'm going to join the service. So I went to the Navy recruiters. Oh no, you'll be stay, you'll stay stateside all during your four years. You'll never get to go to Vietnam. Okay, so I joined the Navy. <laughs> yeah. And what do you think happened three years later? <laughs> I was in Vietnam War Theater. <laughs> Great. At first I was on a destroyer. I was a technician who kept the radars on ships working. Um, those things that spin around and keep an eye on aircraft approaching dangers. You see it in war movies all the time. I got called to British ships, Japanese ships, Canadian ships. You know, if they didn't have personnel to fix their radar systems, then they'd call on people from American ships to help them. My feeling was, it, what are we doing there? What were we doing there while, while I was there? Our captain just received orders to blow up this place and that. And we could actually see them with glasses, people running around here and there. I came out of there a different person, I believe. Um, it opened my eyes to a lot of things that, before that, you, you might say I lived in a box. I didn't care what went on outside of my immediate world. But you step out of that box and go to a place like Vietnam and there are people who have it worse than you do. How they go about surviving is something that we barely imagine living here in, a, say, a secure environment like Nevada. But I always think about that, you know. We're, we're lucky to be living. I got out in 1968. I came back to Alaska. I signed up for the pipeline. Um, two Street in Fairbanks, who uh, oh, had no, had 40 bars in the two block stretch. So I quickly became an alcoholic on Second Avenue. I was patrolling those streets every night. Me and my wife Janice started raising a family. So I built my first house in Nolato, a little cabin in the old town. So we lived there for a while. We had five boys and the only house I could build was up the new town site where there's access to water and sewer. So that's where I got my house now. So I made my living sometimes as a laborer, mostly as a carpenter. Um, because of my experience in the Navy as an electronic technician, I knew the basics of wiring up a house. You know. A lot of the structures you see in the ladder, I worked building those. And then 1993, Congress recognized 256 tribes in Alaska. Nevada Tribal Council was formed, and they hired me as the tribal administrator. No one in interior Alaska knew what a tribal administrator was supposed to do. When most tribes started out, they functioned under their nonprofit corporations as Memorandum of Agreement tribe. TCC received all the money for the programs 
on behalf of the village. Okay, say a dollar comes out of federal government, flows through BIA, 30 cents get dropped off there, all right? Flows through TCC, another 40 cents get dropped off there, all right? So by the time that dollar reaches Nevada Tribal Council, we're only getting 30 cents out of the dollar. So we go contracting, we get the full dollar out of the federal government. Um, how to get there, though, was something that I knew was demanding. Um, you had to commit yourself to the principles of self-determination and self-governance. And um, I, I, I really liked it, liked it, so I focused all my attention on that. In seven years, I brought Nalato Tribal Council from a memorandum of agreement tribe all the way through compacting. And I believe I was the first small tribe to achieve that. I was a tribal administrator for 16 years. And when I retired, I think I had 14 employees. I never drank alcohol all while I was a tribal administrator because I felt my, my role was to be a leader and I couldn't demonstrate true leadership if I was always drinking. And I just quit. For generations, people used to come up Happy Slough, come up the bank. So this is old traditional trails to the Cayuse wetlands. This is our hunting cabin now. <laughs> we just come over here and the moose are in our backyard. Mm -hmm. And so are all the animals to be trapped. The theme of this year's convention is preserving our way of life. The older people, like my generation, we have lived the past. And the young people need to hear these stories about the past if we're going to preserve. You need to understand that our ancestors survived because they were persevering. They were survivalists. They had determination, commitment to provide for themselves, their community, their families. Um, the younger people don't have to live like that anymore, but they can still have that same drive, determination, commitment to preserve not only themselves, but their culture and tradition. 